Thank you very much. Thank you. We've not met. My name is Tom Compass. I'm the director of the Crawford School of Public Policy here in the College of Asia and the Pacific. It's, it's my happy task to welcome you here today, and, and uh, thank you for coming. A special welcome to the ambassador. Ambassador, thank you for being here today. The Indonesia Project is within the Art Corden Department of Economics. is one of the very best things about the Crawford School of Public Policy. Something I'm very proud of, the school is very proud of. The project is arguably the, I don't think there's any doubt about it, it's the single best concentration of the very best scholarship on Indonesia. And its flagship event is this one, the Indonesian Update. The theme this year is the state of education in Indonesia, and it looks like an excellent program. Congratulations to Budi. Where's Budi? Congratulations to Goody. Thank you, Goody, and the team for putting together such a such a, a very good program. It's year 30 for the Indonesia update, which in itself is, is quite remarkable. Before we begin, let me just take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners, the first Australians of the land that we meet on, and pay respects to their elders past and present. It's also my pleasure, of course, to introduce uh, uh, Richard, who's going to launch the update today. Richard will be known to everyone in this room, or should be known to everyone in this room, has over five, a, a wonderful, stunning career, over five decades. Uh, Secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, head of the delegation to the United Nations, the Australian delegation to the United Nations, of course, ambassador to the Philippines and indeed Indonesia. I'm told in his retirement, <laughs> that he's uh, written two books, appeared uh, on, in front of many television cameras and provided an, uh, an incredible set of advice to business and government. This is his third time, I'm told, Hal's told me, the third time he's launched the, the uh, Indonesian Update, once in 1989, I wasn't even in Australia, 2004, 2012 is the third time is a charm. Um, fantastic. Please welcome, wonderful career. Uh, great to have you here, Richard. Please welcome Richard Walcott. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Tom. Um, first, I'd just like to uh, uh, acknowledge some the many old friends of mine, or <coughs> long-standing friends, I should say, uh, in this gathering, and we're delighted in particular to see uh, Bill Fowler, our former ambassador to Indonesia, and my colleague in New York, and also Ambassador Primo here today, and I'm beside her here. Ambassador, you're about to leave us, but you've had a great posting here, and I hope it's been uh, enjoyable for you. Um, so, can you hear me today? That's good. That's good, that's good. Sorry. Um, anyway, it is a pleasure <coughs> and an honor to have been invited to open this Indonesia update, especially as I've returned from a visit to Indonesia only earlier this week. Uh, this is, in fact, as Tom said, the third time that uh, uh, I've been opened the Indonesia update, and I have to say, I feel somewhat recycled. You might have got all the time you can go and pressure, but still. Uh, it, it, maybe it's a curious record, uh, related to my having been around for so long. <coughs> anyway, the first time was in 88 or 89, and the third time uh, is today. Uh, the focus of this today, of this uh, um, update, is of course on the state of education, uh, which is of great importance as both Indonesia and Australian policies uh, have undergone or are undergoing substantial transformation. Education, knowledge uh, are, of course, the key to breaking down ignorance, and there's still plenty of that about each country and the other country. Today, however, there are two main themes, I'm not dealing with education, because that's going to be covered fully in the update. There are two main um, thoughts or, or themes I want to address in the brief time I have this morning. <coughs> Tom, if I go for too long, Tom, me out and I'll stop. Um, the first is the importance of the opportunities 
for Australia and Indonesia to cooperate more closely as the Asian century evolves. Uh, the second is the need to strengthen existing bridges and build new bridges between the two communities, the wider communities, as well as to deepen the relationship between our two countries and relate that relationship more to the current major policy issues which will affect all countries in the Asia-Pacific region. And in that context of the need to build new bridges, new bridges I was, I have to say, disappointed to learn uh, only this week that the, um, um, the University of New South Wales has, has discontinued its, uh, its Indonesian language program and also that the New South Wales Department of Education has abolished the post of coordinator uh, of Indonesian language in state school. Now, such actions are not only regrettable, uh, but they send the wrong message at the wrong time. Um, now, I said I'd uh, start with some general comments about the new situation Australia and Indonesia face. It's now very widely acknowledged that the Asian century, driven by the unprecedented transfer of wealth uh, and influence from the West uh, to the East, or from the Atlantic to the Pacific, has provided opportunities for Australia uh, and Indonesia uh, to enhance their cooperation for their mutual advantage. Now this is a fundamental global change, a sort of seismic shift in the global balance, driven uh, mainly by the spectacular rise of China, but also by the rise of India, and that's reinforced by the um, uh, developed countries, strong, strong economies like Japan, South Korea, and Australia, in addition to the increasing potentials of countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, as well as emerging opportunities in Thailand and the Philippines and in the changing Burma. If you cast your minds back until the, uh, until the end of the Cold War, at the beginning of the 1990s, the two powerful alliance systems of the United States and the former Soviet Union, they actually made the management of the global situation more predictable. Australia and Indonesia, albeit for different reasons, were in fact fairly marginal to the diplomacy of the Cold War. But now, uh, both countries now can uh, play a much more important and constructive role in what is a more, connect, a more interconnected, complex, and multipolar world in the Asian century. The Asian Pacific region is really where the world's major power relationships most closely intersect. It is where the template of the United States China relationship will largely be shaped. It's also the crucible in which the interrelationships uh, on Asian issues involving a range of countries like uh, China, United States, Japan, India, Russia, South Korea, Vietnam, and of course uh, Australia and Indonesia and other ASEAN countries. It's where all this will be worked out in this new situation, I think, both Indonesia and Australia, and particularly their governments, need to uh, determine the more current and appropriate balance in their relations with both the United States and China. Now, while Australia is an ally of the United States and has some different values from China, I think we should welcome the rise of China, and both countries should oppose policies based on the containment of China. There's no intrinsic reason why China have been there recently under a system of authoritarian capitalism uh, in which it will <coughs> seek to overcome the economic and social problems it faces. No intrinsic reason why it can't continue to rise peacefully is, of course, for China to decide its policies and its pace of reform and change without intrusive advice from other countries, including Australia. Now, all this is important uh, to Indonesia, of course, and also to Australia. While the United States is in the throes of a presidential election, 
And China faces a major leadership change next month. This does not alter the enormous importance to both our countries, as well as to all regional countries, that this situation is handled in a cooperative and not in a combative manner. I think adversarial attitudes towards China, and there's been some signs of this in the American election campaign, um, uh, such attitudes towards China could become a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that would not be in our interest or in the interest. China will resist American attempts, some echoed by Australia, to shape attitudes in China and other regional countries. Australia in particular, as an ally in other countries, including Indonesia and the region, I think do need some clarification of the real intentions of the United States in its so-called pivot to Asia. But that really can't become clear until the leaderships in both countries are either changed or re-established. I turn now to the, uh, the um, second issue, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning, and that is the need for closer and more effective bilateral relations uh, between Australia and Indonesia. I do find it a sad fact that our wider communities still do not know enough uh, about uh, the other country. Despite a long history of active involvement in Asia and in Indonesia, uh, in the latter case, going back to our support for Indonesian independence in 1947, um, there has been, uh, this has all been overlaid in the public mind by a number of issues which have attracted extensive media attention. There are many of them, just to mention a few, uh, the um, reporting of the invasion of East Timor in 1975, the deaths of five journalists in Balibo, uh, the extensive media coverage of drug cases, especially the death penalty, uh, and a range of human rights issues, including in West Papua. Um, now, what, uh, what uh, I'd like to focus for a minute on, uh, what do our communities not know about each other? What do we not know about each other? I think many Australian, many Indonesians would not be aware that Australia's demography is changing all the time. 25% of Australians, uh, including the number of people in this audience, were not born um, in Australia. Um, they were born overseas. And some 40% of Australians uh, had one or both parents born overseas. Uh, nor would many Indonesians be aware that Australia's largest sources of students and migrants are now two Asian countries. China and India. In these circumstances, I think Australia must build up a, 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 the habit of regular improved consultation with Indonesia on a wide range of policy issues in advance of major decisions, policy decisions being taken by Australia, which can affect Indonesia. Now, recent examples of our failure to do so with negative consequences for our bilateral relations were our announcement of the ban on live cattle exports to Indonesia without proper consultation in advance. Another was the announcement that we would establish a, um, uh, a refugee asylum seeker regional centre in East Timor. Uh, not that time without consultation, but consultation with the wrong people. Um, and then, of course, the third, I think, was the decision announced during President Obama's visit to rotate 2,500 United States uh, Marines to Darwin. Now, the number itself is not important. Probably more than 2,500 Chinese police around Tiananmen Square. Um, but, uh, as I said, the number is not important, but the style and the timing uh, announced not by Prime Minister Gillard uh, but by Prime Minister Obama in our parliament, without prior discussion with Indonesia, was, I think, on the eve of the East Asian summit to be hosted by President Yudhiyono in Bali, uh, and which many consider sent the wrong message to a number of countries and, uh, and was indeed described 
by the Indonesian Foreign Minister at that time as unhelpful. Now, in all our contacts with Indonesia at all levels, Australia needs to avoid any perception that racism and religious intolerance remain present in political and public attitudes. Because of our history, including the white Australian policy uh, and occasional statements by some Australian politicians, we are on a sort of good behaviour bond in the eyes of many thinking Indonesians. We still remain uncertain about the depth and sincerity of our commitment to the um, uh, Asian and Southwest Pacific neighbourhood in which we live. I've made the point to Ken Henry, who's doing the uh, uh, drafting the uh, uh, Australian, the white paper on Australia in the Asian century, which is coming out very shortly. But Australia really needs a, a a, almost a, a different psyche. We need to, we've been focused for so long on protectors like first the United Kingdom and now the United, United States, but we need this. Uh, change, I think, and put the same sort of emphasis that we used to put on most countries, on countries like uh, Indonesia in particular, but also China, Japan, India. Uh, a, we need to get those balances better and more correct. Now, when I was ambassador to Indonesia in the mid-70s, uh, Adam Swartz wrote a far-sighted book called A Nation in Waiting. Now, Indonesia is no longer a nation in waiting. Um, it is now a member of the G20 and, in, and, it, uh, and an important regional and global country. Most Australians would be unaware of the great changes in, in, in Indonesia over the last decade and in particular over the last few years. Um, democracy is now virtually institutionalised in Indonesia. Uh, the Indonesian economy is in strong position growing at a rate second only to China at present. Um, although substantial poverty still exists, per capita incomes are still increasing, and Indonesia now has a middle class of some 40 million people. Economic growth is robust at 6.3%, although inflation has been rising since February. It was 4.45% uh, in June, which is still within Bank Indonesia's uh, accepted target. Um, many Australians would be surprised to learn that according to the latest IMF calculations, Australia's economy, in normal US terms, is the 13th largest in the world, while Indonesia is currently the 16th largest. But in real, what economists call PPP terms, Indonesia now ranks 15th globally, um, and uh, Australia 18. Now, I think few Australians would be aware of the way in which the Indonesian economy is growing, the opportunities that provides, um, and uh, also I think they're probably unaware that uh, Indonesia is expected by the World Bank and the IMF to be one of the world's 10 top economies by 2030 and in the top five by 2040. Unfortunately, wider public attitudes to Indonesia, I think, are oft, still often ill-informed. I'm now talking about public attitudes, not government, of course. Um, they're ill-informed and out-of-date, as indicated in recent Lowy Institute surveys of Australian public opinion. For example, I'm disappointed to read uh, that there's been almost no change over the last three surveys that only 54% of Australians polled have what's called a positive attitude towards Indonesia. Now that's not helpful to us. Um, and 30% of Australians polled still apparently see Indonesia as a threat to our security. Uh, <laughs> crazy, in my view. Um, anyway, uh, I guess the, for these uh, statistics, uh, I presume that they're they're presumably based not on any reality, but on a mixture of fear because of Indonesia's size and proximity and the complexity of its society. Um, to conclude, yes, I should turn my head. <laughs> to conclude, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia is without question Australia's largest, most complex, most populous, and most influential neighbour. 
we tend not to sort of grade countries, but inevitably the, of the, the countries with which our relations are most important. Uh, uh, Indonesia, China, the United States, Japan, probably India coming into that group, and uh, the wider range of the United Nations. Um, so uh, uh, I think, um, as I said, to conclude, our political leaders, I think, should seek to inspire change, lead change on the question of our relationship with Indonesia, rather than allow themselves to fan the flames of exaggerated fears and of religious intolerance, often for domestic political reasons. That is why I think today's update is so important. The Australian and Indonesian governments need to develop, as I've said, regular and more effective consultation on a wide range of policy issues. And we, as we have developed in the past with the United Kingdom and the United States, the wider Australian and Indonesian communities also need to know much more about each other uh, than they do. Education in both countries and public diplomacy have major roles to play in advancing this most important cause. Success will be crucial, uh, especially in our largest and closest neighbour, uh, Indonesia, as the Asian century unfolds. Uh, the update is, of course, one of the uh, instruments which can play an important role uh, in this process, and I'm frankly uh, delighted to have been asked again to open the 2012 update. If you declare it open, I declare it open. <laughs> Richard, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was wonderful. I think you should come back for a fourth time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Before I turn over to the economic update, let me just, just say uh, a few things. First, um, again, thank you all for coming today. I also need to thank, uh, I'm happy to thank the sponsors, in particular Ozay, who's been supporting the Indonesia project for over 15 years, a long time, 15 years. Also thank the Australia Indonesia Business Council, College of Asia and Pacific. Thank you all for your support. Um, please join me again in thanking Richard for his wonderful remarks.